Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hi, I'm Will Summerlin. I'm an analyst at ARC Invest. I cover enterprise software and AI. Joined today by Andrew Kim. Hi everyone, I'm Andrew Kim, and I am the web associate under uh, Will and uh, Nick, covering both consumer internet and enterprise software. So today we're going to talk through our thesis for Zoom, as well as our open source Zoom model that's available on GitHub. We're going to cover our top-down research um, that we generally do at ARC, as well as the research that we've done for Zoom, talk about our bottoms-up analysis of Zoom, dig into the modes that we believe Zoom has, as well as the competitive dynamics we think are going to play out in the space, talk through the model and key drivers, and finally close out with the overall AI opportunity that we see playing out over the next decade and how we think Zoom can capture some of that opportunity. So I'll go ahead and start top down. So at ARC, whenever we think about researching a company, we first start by trying to understand the market opportunity. Uh, we do a lot of work around cost declines of specific technology platforms, try to understand markets and, and the dynamics within those markets, how we think they're going to play out over a five or in this case, 10 year period. Um, and we did that work here with Zoom. And so with Zoom, you know, we looked at the state of work for knowledge workers. Uh, we looked at the growth of knowledge workers, which we believe will grow from just under a billion dollar, a billion users today to just over a billion users uh, by 2026, excluding China. And you know, we think that knowledge workers are in the future going to work in a hybrid environment where some workers are at office, some workers are at home. We saw this adoption play out through COVID. And as of today, we think about 50% of knowledge workers are working in this hybrid environment. We actually think that's going to continue to grow. So by 2026, we think about 75% of knowledge workers will work in an environment that's hybrid, where some of their teammates are in office, some of their teammates work from home. Um, and we see this playing out for a couple of reasons. Uh, first is sort of the talent dynamics, labor dynamics. Um, we found that many employees prefer to work remote and oftentimes if a company forces them to go into the office, they'll actually leave that company and go work somewhere where they have more flexibility. Second is we see talent becoming more global. Um, so as companies look for uh, you know, roles in engineering and, and, and sort of other high demand labor fields, um, we see them looking outside of just the San Francisco Bay Area not only across the country, but actually globally. Um, and so when companies open up their talent pools, you know, geographically, um, you know, we see sort of improved uh, talent acquisition rates, and that sort of naturally encourages this remote, remote and hybrid work environment. And so, you know, when companies, uh, you know, move to this hybrid model, obviously they need software that enables their employees to communicate and be productive. And that's really where Zoom comes in. You know, Zoom through COVID became really the default video conferencing solution for both enterprise use cases as well as consumer use cases, right? We all probably use Zoom to chat with our friends and family to do social happy hours. Uh, and as we come out of COVID, you know, we see that sort of free usage declining and we see churn within that free user base. And we see those free users being replaced uh, by enterprise users who are depending on Zoom and other products like Microsoft Teams and Google Hangouts and WebEx to actually enable productivity within their hybrid workforce. So we spent a lot of time trying to understand the opportunity and size the opportunity for communication software within the context of hybrid work. And that sort of builds into the overall communication software market, uh, which Gartner put at about $1.5 trillion as of 2021. So the other sort of top-down work we did related to Zoom is AI productivity. And we think that AI software will enable humans to be more productive. We actually see this today. Um, if you look at tools like OpenAI Codex, uh, it can solve about 30% of coding tasks according to OpenAI. And when paired with a human programmer, 
the coupled AI plus human are much more productive than a human alone. We also see this with a tool like Dolly 2, uh, which is another tool out of OpenAI that actually takes text input and generates really creative images. And if you go on Twitter, you can see, uh, you know, there are many Twitter accounts that have sort of dedicated themselves to posting examples of Dolly 2, Dolly 2 generated images. And we think Zoom is in a really unique position to benefit from this sort of trend towards AI productivity. We obviously all spend a lot of time on meetings. I think generally speaking, meetings have a, a lot of room to improve when it comes to productivity. We think AI can be part of, of the solution. And we'll talk about that towards the end of, of the podcast here. So that's the top-down work that we did when we're thinking about this opportunity. In Bottoms Up at Arc, whenever we think about a company, um, we really measure it on four factors. The first is people management and culture. And so we spend a lot of time trying to understand the leadership, their background, their motivation, why they're building a company, the culture of that company, the talent that they've been able to attract and retain. And in the case of Zoom, Eric, who is the CEO, founder and CEO, he was previously at WebEx or previously at Cisco and really led engineering for WebEx um, and left out of, to some degree, frustration. He saw an opportunity to rebuild that, that technology stack from the ground up using modern solutions and modern technology and really improve the underlying service. And you know we've spent a lot of time with Eric and his management team and we always walk away impressed. Uh, we think he has a grand vision. His motivation or his, his saying is, is make everyone happy. He wants to make his customers happy, his employees happy. Um, and he's really dedicated his life to, to making Zoom the best company it can possibly be. They've also attracted really strong talent. You know, recently they just made an, an executive hire from Google, uh, spent a lot of time building Google Cloud, who was previously in executive roles at SAP, really understands the enterprise go-to-market motion. Um, so we're excited to see that hire come aboard. And they built a sort of equally strong bench on the engineering and product side. So that's the sort of first factor is people management and culture. Second is product leadership. When it comes to product leadership, we really want to understand uh, not only what product a company has built and the value that that product creates, but also their vision and their roadmap. What products are they building in the future? Um, and with Zoom, you know, obviously they've built a, a very high quality video conferencing solution. You know, it's objectively the, the, the best in terms of audio and video quality, uh, as well as reliability. Uh, but they're not stopping there. You know, they're continuing to innovate and build additional products like Zoom Phone, whiteboard, contact center, and they have a pretty uh, deep roadmap of, of products and features that they want to build over time. Uh, and so, you know, we think that they're in a sort of strong position from a product leadership standpoint. They have over a thousand engineers that are building product. So they're certainly not just sitting there doing nothing. They're continuing to innovate. The third factor is execution. And this is really taking that vision and actually turning it into reality. And we were, uh, you know, we walked away impressed from Zoom's sort of execution through COVID. Uh, you know, it was from an engineering and product standpoint, you know, it was, it was quite difficult to scale up the service as fast as they did. Uh, and, you know, we think that represents their ability to really be agile and flex when they need to when it comes to execution. Um, you know, we've also seen them really ramp up the enterprise sales go to, motion, go to market motion within the last uh, 12 months. Obviously, the, we've seen additional or sort of increased churn within that free user base. And we've seen headwinds in terms of growth with that free user base. Um, and so Zoom's go-to-market can really be broken up into that sort of free user base, um, that self-serve, and in some cases paid user base, right? Small businesses or other, other accounts that come through the website um, and buy Zoom without talking to anyone. And then the enterprise uh, customers who end up talking to a sales rep as part of the sales process. And you know we see sort of headwinds, continued headwinds on the self-serve front. And that's okay, you know, we expect that. And we'll talk about that when we get to our drivers. And, and when it comes to free users, that's actually a good thing because it improves margins when those users churn out. Uh, but we've, you know, we've seen them really building up their ability to sell to enterprises. Um, and I think, you know, there's so, still some distance to travel there, uh, but I think they've made a number of, of really strong sales leadership hires and they're continuing to execute on that front. The final factor that we look at is moat or barriers to entry. And so, you know, as a company grows, we like their moat to get stronger, right? We like them to become harder to compete with over time, um, not easier to compete with. And you know, we love opportunities that are winner take most outcomes, where it's a very large market that's growing quickly that we believe you know one or two companies will sort of own at the end of the day. And when it comes to Zoom, you know, we've gotten a lot of questions on Twitter since we published this open source model relating to Zoom's moat um, and the competitive dynamics. 
And just to dive into this, you know, we really think Zoom has, um, you know, four different barriers to entry to remotes. The first is their infrastructure. And so as they scaled through COVID, you know, they spent a lot of time and capital building a very resilient infrastructure to host audio and video conferencing. And, you know, that shows up sort of as Zoom's, uh, you know, quality, video, audio quality and reliability scores that are superior to all of their competitors. Um, they're continuing to invest in that underlying infrastructure. And it's really sort of this invisible, um, you know, invisible investment that I think most people don't see. It's not a button on a screen, but it's really the underlying infrastructure that, that allows Zoom to, um, you know, host audio and video with high quality across a wide range of, of sort of bandwidth um, scenarios. And so right now, um, you know, I, I'm sitting in, in California. Andrew is actually in South Korea at the moment for the next couple of weeks. And we Zoom each other multiple times a day. Um, and we can do so without latency, um, you know, with, with different bandwidth. And, and it works just fine. And that's pretty incredible. And so, you know, we, we've seen Zoom sort of build this infrastructure that allows them to scale. Uh, and we think that's actually a barrier to entry. Uh, it's very expensive to build that infrastructure. Um, Zoom's continuing to invest in that infrastructure. And if you were starting from zero today and trying to build that infrastructure, it would be quite difficult and it would be very expensive. So that's the first barrier to entry. The second is what we call you know, enterprise readiness. And when selling to an enterprise, they require a lot of features that consumers don't really care about. Um, you know, things like role-based access control, uh, underlying security features and functionality, other things like that that are sort of under the surface that most consumers don't see or don't care about, but matter a lot to enterprise. And so, you know, Zoom over the last 12, 24 months has spent a lot of time, capital, building these enterprise features and functionalities um, things like role-based access control, security, that matter a lot to enterprises that sort of give them a um, you know, strong position from which to sell into the enterprise. Uh, and you know they have built these features. Others have these features. Microsoft obviously has some of these features, but we think it sort of separates them from, from other competitors. The third is um, AI sort of data advantages. And so we'll talk about this more towards the end, but we think Zoom's in a really unique strategic position to build AI features and functionality. And you know, they have millions and millions and millions of hours of audio and video data from which they can build and train very complicated, sophisticated AI models. And when it comes to AI, really your model is only as good as the data it's trained on. And in the case of Zoom, they have a huge quantity of data that they can pull from to train models. And we think that's going to allow them to develop very useful AI features and functionalities in the future. The final barrier to entry that I'll point to, and this really separates them from companies like Microsoft, is their independence and their integration with a third-party ecosystem of applications. And so in enterprise software, if you think about the way a business operates, they have many, many different vendors, right? They have Zoom for audio and video. They have Salesforce for CRM. Maybe they use Monday for, for, for another use case. And um, you want to create workflows that stitch these applications together. And Zoom has built a really robust ecosystem of third-party integrations. You can see for yourself. Go to Zoom's website and look at apps. And they've built integrations with companies like Salesforce and Monday.com. And that basically means that they've become integrated within work streams or workflows within an enterprise. And so if you're a sales rep, you know, you have a CRM system maybe with Salesforce and your video calls are set up using Zoom and it's all automated through Salesforce. Uh, and once you're integrated within these workflows, it's really hard to rip and replace, right? Companies um, that have sort of trained their, trained their workforce on these, on these workflows are very hesitant to rip and replace with new tools. Um, and so Zoom's integrated themselves with this third-party ecosystem. And there's an interesting competitive dynamic where Microsoft in particular competes with many third-party application vendors, right? Microsoft has a sort of broad range of, of products, um, including CRM. And so while there are some integrations, they're less incentivized to integrate with third-party applications and more incentivized to integrate um, within the Microsoft 365 ecosystem. And, um, you know, for some customers, that's great, right? Some customers uh, want all their software to be through Microsoft, but many enterprises are, are hesitant in that regard. Uh, and so, you know, we see, you know, some companies electing to use Zoom because they don't want to be completely locked into Microsoft. They want sort of independence from Microsoft, especially when it comes to a tool as critical as audio and video communication. Uh, and so, you know, we see some customers electing to use Zoom because the quality is superior, Right, uh, you know, quality matters a lot more when it comes to real-time collaboration uh, than you know, say, a, a software that maybe he used once a week um, that can be used asynchronously. 
So that quality really matters to many customers. We see some customers choosing Zoom because of security, uh, and they've you know been able to win some very sort of security conscious customers, you know, within not only commercial sector but also within the government sector. I think that speaks to the security investments. We, we see some customers choosing Zoom because of the independence, right? Because it's simply not Microsoft. Um, because maybe that company uses Microsoft for chat, right? Or or email, and they don't want all their communications locked into a single vendor. Um, so those are really the three reasons we see companies choosing Zoom over Microsoft, over Google, over other third parties. And we think that AI could actually be a you know, really important differentiator in the future where companies choose Zoom because the uh, AI features and functionalities enable them to have more productive collaboration and more productive meetings. Um, and so, you know, as we talk through the drivers and get to AI, we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit more. But with that, I'll hand it over to Andrew to talk through our modeling process and the key drivers in our model. Thank you, Will. Um, I'd like to mention that we elaborate on Zoom's technical leadership and moat in the first blog we published on the company back in September of last year, which we believe is still applicable today, uh, called We Believe Zoom is the Fabric Connecting Global Enterprise Communications and the Future of Work. Uh, so we encourage listeners to check that blog out for further information. We attribute the most importance to four specific drivers in our Zoom model, namely, number one, the number of knowledge workers around the globe that employ a hybrid or fully remote working arrangement with the exclusion of knowledge workers residing in mainland China. Uh, two, the total number of Zoom users at the per seat level uh, rather than at the per company level. Uh, number three, the total number of Zoom users who are paying for the service. And finally, number four, the average paying users annual expenditure on Zoom, which we simply refer to as ARPU throughout the model and the companion blog. Uh, you can see within our model uploaded on GitHub that like ARC has done with the Tesla open source model, we have provided both a manual valuation tab and the Monte Carlo valuation tab. Uh, within the manual valuation tab, the reader will be able to adjust uh, point forecasts to their liking for whatever line item they choose. Though we note that the cells with red text uh, refer to what we think is the entire set of valuation drivers most uh, meaningful for Zoom. Uh, with the Monte Carlo model, however, we specify a lower and upper bound to the aforementioned drivers and assume them to be the 25th and 75th percentile inputs respectively, all the while assuming a normal distribution for all drivers. Uh, Monte Carlo models are interesting because each simulation randomly selects a point estimate within the specified distribution for each driver, uh, allowing the reader to visualize after hundreds or thousands of iterations what the resulting target would be for Zoom's uh, future per share price at each percentile over the entire simulation set as yielded by our model. Detailed explanation on how to use the model as well as information on each tab uh, can be found within the table of contents tab in the model itself. Um, going back to the four drivers, uh, we want to use this time to briefly reiterate our rationale detailed in the companion blog, but I guess here in conversation. In June 2021, Gartner projected that 51% of knowledge workers worldwide would adopt either a hybrid or fully remote working arrangement by the end of the year. Uh, seems it was an underestimate as Slack's future forum pulse report from January 2022 uh, estimated that 58% and 12% of all global knowledge workers worked in hybrid or fully remote arrangements respectively, meaning that 70% were doing either by January 22. This figure decreased to 66% by Slack's latest report in April, with increased pressures to return to the office as a part of a larger post-COVID reopening dynamic. Uh, but we believe this to be a temporary divot, as employee backlash and overall labor shortages can compel employers to drop in-office mandates sooner rather than later. Uh, in our base case, we expect hybrid or fully remote penetration to reach 75% in 2026, or within the next five years from 489 million knowledge workers in 2021 to 832 million in 2026. Uh, we provide a 15 percentage point margin of error for our bear and bull cases, uh, forecasting 60% and 90% penetration respectively. 
Uh, we estimate that Zoom's penetration or the number of Zoom users over the number of hybrid or remote knowledge workers outside of mainland China grew from 8% in 2019 to 45% in 2020 with the onset of the pandemic and slipped down to 43% in 2021. Uh, in our base case, we project that Zoom will linearly lose one to two percentage points in the market share per year to 35% in 2026 with continued competition against productivity suites and smaller UCAS players. We also provide a 15 percentage point margin of error here for our bear and bull cases, forecasting 20% capture and 50% capture of the hybrid or remote knowledge worker base. As we elaborate in the blog, we believe that Zoom's monetization of its user base and the resulting ARPU are the most important drivers of Zoom's top line growth. Uh, we estimate past monetization rates by simply taking Zoom's historical fiscal year revenues and dividing them by our estimate of historical ARPU. For the latter, we take Zoom's most affordable video conferencing plan, a Zoom Meetings Pro, which at face value costed $180 per seat per year until 2021, when, when it was lowered to $150 per seat per year. Um, from earnings calls, meetings with management, and meetings with third-party experts, we, we understand that enterprise discounts from bulk purchases can range anywhere from 10 to 15%, all the way to more than 50% at times. Uh, given the wide range, we take 25% as a rough midpoint, given that the split between enterprise customers and retail or SMB customers, known as online customers, uh, is roughly 50-50 assuming the online cohort spends the listed price and the roughly 50-50 revenue contribution holds true, our ARPU assumption implies low historical spend by enterprises on a per seat basis, pointing to roughly $76 per year uh, per seat or $6.30 per month, or a little more than what Microsoft would charge for Teams Essentials at the listed $4 a month. Uh, first, we are comfortable with this ARPU assumption in that we believe Zoom phones, Zoom rooms, and other newer services do not materially contribute to total revenue yet, meaning that the baseline assumption that Zoom's monetized user base employs Zoom Meetings Pro, um, in our opinion, is reasonable. Furthermore, the point of approximating historical ARPU is to divide historical total revenue by ARPU to, to approximate the number of paying seats. So higher the ARPU holding revenue fixed, we conclude at a lower monetized base and vice versa. Uh, we have tuned our ARPU assumptions such that we are comfortable with the implied number of paying users after cross-checking with various sources. And we also found that the trade-off between higher ARPU and lower monetized base versus lower ARPU and higher monetized base does not make a significant impact on our model as we have high conviction in strong growth for both metrics. Uh, specifically, we approximate that 17% of total Zoom users were paying users at the end of 2021, uh, down from approximately 24% in 2017. Uh, we forecast in our base case that 50% of Zoom's user base will be paying users in 2026. Um, attempting to abstract this forecast, we would suggest that as we believe enterprise becomes the dominant cohort in Zoom's total user base over the next five years, uh, the average Zoom call between two parties would require at least one party to be a paying user. Uh, we believe enterprises will continue to be attracted to, in our opinion, uh, Zoom's superior audiovisual quality and as a tool that has become a household name in inter-enterprise communications, uh, Zoom, we believe, uh, should become the communications tool of choice for professionals. Uh, many may have seen the incident uh, with CNBC in which Kathy was speaking in an interview when she was interrupted by a timeout warning uh, from CNBC's end due to them using the free service. Uh, thus, we believe the idea that a Zoom call between two parties entailing at least one party to be a paying user to be reasonable for the sake of, at the very least, professionalism. Um, going back to our forecasts, we believe in our bear and bull cases that Zoom will monetize 20% and 80% of its users in 2026, providing a 30% margin of error from our base case midpoint. Given that we provide conservative estimates for historical ARPU, we believe that Zoom has many channels to boost ARPU growth in the next five years. 
First, we believe that baseline spend will evolve from the video conferencing centric Zoom Meetings Pro to Zoom United Pro, which is currently Zoom's least expensive bundled offering, including video conferencing, enterprise phone, and chat. Uh, after applying the 25% enterprise discount, we believe that the average proceeds spent on Zoom's core offering will increase from $113 today to $188 in 2026 at a CAGR of 11% per year. Uh, the other significant boost to our ARPU forecasts in our base and bull cases is Zoom's conversational AI opportunity and the suite of productivity tools that an AI offering would enable. Um, assuming the successful rollout and adoption of AI products as the recently announced Zoom IQ for sales teams, uh, we believe that the average paying users will spend $94 or 50% of the total cost of Zoom's core products on Zoom IQ and AI related products and services in our base case. In our bull case, we believe that the average paying users uh, will spend $188 or 100% of the total cost of Zoom's core products on those services. At a higher level, then, we believe that AI represents 26% and 35% of total forecasted ARPU in our base and bull cases. Uh, we attribute meaningful contribution from webinars and Zoom events, Zoom rooms, and Zoom's contact center opportunity as well in our base and bull cases. Uh, but we believe the aforementioned contributions from the core product and AI opportunity represent Zoom's uh, largest growth vectors. Um, I'll now pass it back to Will. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. So I'll, I'll start by saying, you know, we could be wrong. And that's why we open source these models. We encourage you to download the models, put in your own assumptions, and please provide us with your feedback. Go on to Twitter, um, you know, post tweets under our, our, our thread and, and, and provide us with feedback and, and, and your opinion. That's the whole purpose of open sourcing the models. But just to touch on the AI opportunity, I'll start kind of top down and talk about how we see Zoom possibly capturing some of this opportunity. You know, we've seen tremendous progress in AI, specifically in deep learning in the last couple of years. And I talked about Codex and DALI2 as a couple of examples. We've seen large language models like GPT-3, which is uh, basically a very, very large model that can generate text um, and so you can use GPT-3 to generate poems, to write songs, to tell jokes, um, to do a whole wide range of, of tasks. And, you know, in many narrow tasks, we're starting to see deep learning perform at or above human levels of performance. And what's so interesting is, you know, the larger the model is, oftentimes the better the performance of the model. And so we've seen this trend where the larger the model, the more performance. The challenge is the larger the model, the more expensive it is to train. And some of these large models are already, you know, costing millions, tens of millions, in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars to train. The good news is we're seeing significant cost declines. So between 2015 and 2020, we saw the cost to train a model to perform a specific task drop at a rate of about 65% per year. And this is a combination of innovations on the hardware front, Right, so something looking like Moore's law, but sort of um, you know advancing at a rate more quickly than Moore's law. Um, so improvements on the actual compute stack, and then improvements on software, right? Algorithmic efficiency. Uh, there's still a lot of low hanging fruit in deep learning, and an opportunity for you know engineers and, and data scientists and research scientists to make algorithms more efficient in the way that they learn. And so you know, looking forward, we believe that deep learning training costs, neural net specifically training costs will continue to fall at a rate of about 60% per year through 2030. Uh, and so just to put that in context, a model that performs similar to GPT-3, uh, so GPT-3 cost just over $5 million to train by our estimates in 2020. A model that would perform at a similar level in 2030, we think would only cost $500 to train. And so that puts into perspective like the sort of magnitude of the cost decline that we're, we're expecting. Um, and what that means is AI is going to be more accessible, but at the top end where companies are continuing to invest tens of millions of dollars, you're going to get much, much more capability out of these very large models. And so what that translates to in terms of productivity is, again, we think that AI coupled with humans will be far more productive um, than humans alone or than AI alone. Uh, and so we actually think that the value of a knowledge worker will increase at a CAGR, a compounded annual growth rate, of about 15% per year 
against a base of wage growth of about 2.66% per year through 2030. And so what that means is that a knowledge worker today globally makes between twenty-five dollars and $30,000. Um, we think that that knowledge worker will make about $36,000 by 2030 uh, based on sort of expected wage growth. But the value of that knowledge worker in 2030 will actually be $86,000 because AI creates a $50,000 productivity uplift on a per knowledge worker basis. And so that means by 2030, we should get about 140% productivity uplift per knowledge worker, which is just absolutely extraordinary. And then the question becomes, okay, well, how does that actually show up and, and work? And there are tools that are going to be domain specific, things we talked about like Codex. Um, that's a coding tool that actually helps software engineers be more productive. You know, tools like Dolly 2 that enable graphic designers and artists to be more productive. Uh, but then there are tools and software that we think will make all knowledge workers more productive. And that's really where we see Zoom coming in. And if you think about Zoom's strategic positioning here, as I mentioned, you know, we, every knowledge worker that I know spends a lot of their day on meetings, right? Collaborating with other knowledge workers. And those meetings are not very productive, right? Um, you know, we spend a lot of time talking. Oftentimes <clears throat> we leave a meeting, we forget about what we talked about. And we have another meeting to talk about that issue again. And if you think about the role that AI can play in making those meetings more productive, there are low-hanging fruit sort of features and functionalities like taking notes. Imagine if um, Zoom or other video conferencing solutions could actually take notes from your meetings, right, and summarize your meetings. Imagine if they could create um, sort of action items and follow up next steps, right? And so imagine if, you know, Andrew and I were on a Zoom and we said, hey, you know, we should schedule another meeting to talk about this topic. Imagine if Zoom could automatically schedule the next meeting if it had integrations with our calendars, going back to that sort of ecosystem of third-party integrations that we talked about. And those are you know, two of many, many examples of how we think AI can make meetings more productive. Uh, we're also seeing this show up in um, you know, external meetings like sales calls. And that's really where Zoom is, is you know, planting the flag when it comes to AI. The Zoom IQ is a tool, uh, as Andrew mentioned, that enables uh, you know, sales reps to make their meetings more productive, right? It gives them feedback and analytics on their meetings. It can take notes, um, you know, call out specific, uh, you know, important key points through a conversation. And, you know, if you think about a rep, a sales rep in tech, that say has a quota of a million dollars per year, if a tool like Zoom IQ can hypothetically increase their close rate by 10%, you know, that's creating $100,000 in value. And that's pretty extraordinary. And, you know, Zoom could capture a meaningful share of that. In our model, we are very conservative in how we, in our view, we're very conservative in how we sort of show Zoom monetizing that. Um, but we think that there is a sort of much larger uh, opportunity for Zoom and AI. Broadly speaking, we think the opportunity for AI software will reach about $14 trillion a year globally, excluding China, by 2030. And if you think about all the time that knowledge workers spend in meetings, and you think about the productivity uplift potential within those meetings, um, you know, we think Zoom's in a really interesting position to sort of make humans more productive. Uh, and so on the technology front, going back to this data advantage concept, the more data you have, specifically the more quality data you have, the better you can build models and train models. And you know, Zoom, think about all the data that Zoom has from all the meetings that we participate in, right? Audio, video, et cetera. And Zoom can leverage that data to actually improve or build and improve the, the quality of their models. And there's this feedback loop as well. And that if, you know, say Zoom rolls out a feature to um, you know, schedule follow-up meetings hypothetically, and, um, you know, they see that, um, you know, they, they flagged a, a, a potential follow-up meeting, they auto-scheduled it, and then everybody joins that meeting and participates. Well, that means they probably successfully capture what they were supposed to capture, right? It means we actually had the intention of a follow-up meeting. And so they can use that as sort of a label to continue tuning the system. Whereas if they schedule a follow-up meeting and no one joins that meeting or the meeting lasts 30 seconds, that could be an indication that they weren't supposed to actually schedule a follow-up meeting, that they, they misunderstood our, our indication. Um, and so they can use that to again further tune the model. And so the same way that Tesla captures tremendous amounts of data um, you know, from users driving around the road and uses that data to train full self-driving and autopilot, we think Zoom can use these data assets to build AI features and functionalities to make meetings more productive. Uh, and so, you know, we think that's a really interesting opportunity. Zoom is just starting to move in that direction with Zoom IQ. 
And you know, we expect them to continue pushing in that direction. We've heard Zoom talk about this publicly, their ambitions when it comes to AI. Um, and we think that will be sort of a really interesting opportunity for Zoom over the next five years. So with that said, really appreciate you taking the time to listen today. Um, please download the model, put in your own assumptions, play around with it, and provide us with your feedback on Twitter. Also, feel free to reach out if you have any questions regarding the model or our thesis on Zoom broadly. Thank you. Thank you. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.